So the topic tonight is certainly a very hot topic. It is all about self-managed super fund property investment. Um, and it's such a hot topic. We know it's such a growth uh, in Australia with more and more people taking control of their retirement strategies. There's over 1.1 million people in a self-managed super fund at the moment, which is just an incredible number. The numbers are jumping up by double digit percentages every year and more and more people are choosing to move away from retail superannuation funds and, and choose their own destiny, if you like. And there's a lot around that. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of complexity with it and hence why we wanted to run this very, very special webinar tonight. So thank you very much for, for joining us. As we kick off, we're very fortunate tonight. We do have a bit of a panel. We'll try to not make this too much death by PowerPoint. Uh, my name's David Bruce. Uh, I'll be your host tonight, but, but more importantly, we've got three real experts in this field that I want to introduce. Firstly, we have Sam Khalil, who is the Managing Director of DPN. Hi, David. Sam, yeah, thank you, Sam. Good to see you. Um, for anyone who doesn't know Sam or hasn't had the opportunity to hear Sam speak, he's the Managing Director of our business, more than 20 years experience in property investment, started in financial planning, funnily enough, um, but certainly grown a very, very robust and successful business. And he'll share his, his insight and expertise around you know, the strategies for, for, for property investment in this space. We're also joined by another member of our team, Mark Moenting. He's the Director of Finance. Mark, good to see you tonight. Good evening, David. Thanks for having us and good evening all. Yes, and, and Mark's been with our business a number of years now after successfully running a number of finance businesses and, and, and specifically Mark's expertise tonight is not just around property investment funding and finance, but specifically funding for an SMSF property investment. So we'll certainly get a lot from that. And we're really, really excited tonight. We've got a special guest, Robert Zabuyan. He is the director slash financial planner from MPM Wealth Management, and he's a very uh, dear customer and client to, to DPM. We have a strategic relationship together, known Rob for a number of years. His business has been around for over 10 years. And as he likes to say, they started during the GFC. So they must have done something right to get that business to become how, what it is today. But um, they focus holistically in all sorts of uh, retirement planning strategies, wealth building strategies, setting up self-managed super funds and more. And we're really pleased to have Robert. So thanks for joining us tonight, Robert. Thanks for having me, David. Thanks, everyone. Yes, so that's fantastic. So that's our expert panel we have for you tonight. Um, just a few disclaimers up front, which is really important around this because it's all very much to, important to understand for everybody that's certainly not to be taken as financial advice. This is financial education and it's an information session. And it certainly doesn't take in anybody's individual personal circumstances and we strongly recommend that you do work with an expert team that can help you um, navigate what's important for your specific needs and requirements. And just to follow that on DPM, we don't provide any of those SMSF establishment services, rather we're the property vehicle that can help you get property once you've got a self-managed superannuation fund established. Um, we've also got an, a little bit more of a T's and C's here. There's a little bit to read here, so I'll summarize, but essentially here, we do need to state up front for <clears throat> Robert's benefit for his business, MPM Financial Services, that around this piece here, that it's, it's very much general in nature. It's not to be taken as specific advice. And we absolutely recommend that people get appropriate professional advice based on their own circumstances. So it's just important that we do put that up front. We know you're going to get a lot of value out of today. So we won't dwell on that too much, but it's been clear that, that we certainly in, uh, advocate that people get independent financial advice. I've said before at the previous webinars, we love a quote. And we'd love this one from George Foreman. And the question isn't at what age I want to retire, but it's at what income. So I think we're all squarely uh, in agreement for that. It's certainly about now that the age of retirement is extending and people working longer. I've recently just turned 50 and I'm still staring down the barrel of many years of my working life ahead of me. And it is very much about what is that income? What does that wealth look like? What does that retirement look like for for individuals as they start to plan those, uh, those years. So now what we also like to do is to run some polls to get a little bit of a feel of who's on the call and basically understand where people might be at. And if you bear with me just for half a moment, I'm just going to launch the first poll. And this one is very much, are you a member of a self-managed super fund? 
good to see where we know from the people that have joined us of those people that may be considering, they're not in it, they're just interested to learn all about it, or those that actually have a fund established. Great to see some great responses here at the moment as we go through. Interesting there. So we'll end that poll and I'll share the results. Interestingly, and this is a, these polls are anonymous, by the way, um, but essentially we see that basically the, the, the majority there do sit squarely, either they're, they're not in a, in a, in a fund or, or they're actually in their own self-managed super fund or they're considering it while well, we've got two in five have their own setup. So it'll be a good information session here today and really help our panel navigate the dialogue with you to understand those people that have a fund and might be ready to look at a, a property investment in the shorter term versus those that are starting their journey. I have one more question to ask the audience. And this is squarely at the people that have their self-managed super fund already set up. If you are a member, do you currently use property as an investment strategy? So again, this will help us understand just the makeup of the people that are joining us tonight. And it is completely anonymous, by the way. So some great results there again, and thank you very much. Okay, so we'll end that one there and we'll share those results. So it's, it's closer to 50-50, about 56% actually do use property already, which is great to see. And we've got a number of people that still haven't activated that for their individual circumstance at the moment. So it's really great for, for the information for us to help frame some of the dialogue and the information we'll share tonight. And we thank you very much for, for, for partaking in that. So now we'll basically get straight into the information we want to share with you. I'd love to hand over to, to Sam Carlil. He's going to kick us off and really talk about where we see simply as property being a trusted asset class. So Sam, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, David. And thank you to everyone for joining us. And uh, see, uh, there's a lot of new people joining us and a lot of uh, repeat, uh, I don't know what do you call people that continue on webinars. Web, webinar groupies and, or existing clients. So thank you for joining us again. And look, before we jump into some of the technicalities around SMSF and, and what have you, and I guess people are here obviously because they're interested either in SMSF or property as an investment in that. And um, people would always like to know what's the take on the, on the property market and, you know, as an asset class, you know, what's, What's the feeling out there at the moment? And I, I guess I sort of span a bit of sector in property and connect in property uh, at a number of levels. Um, run a property investment business. We're involved in specialist disability accommodation. I'm also involved in a number of luxury developments, working on some projects. And um, I've been um, liaising with uh, Michael Pallia from Sotheby's, who has just been hitting some records. So if you think of uh, where we started here at this pandemic around about March and some of the parallels of being in a one 100 year pandemic, that it's, this is the worst it's been for Australia since the Great Depression. Um, I mean, I mean if, if I was running another poll, I'd ask how many people here have been on food rations and who has not been able to eat food. Um, and so some of those parallels have been sort of highly sensationalized. Um, and the reality is, I think we've got still more an issue of obesity than an issue of food, food shortage uh, in our nation or in some nations of the world. Uh, Michael Pallia is just, you know, in the last two months, uh, when we talk about, you know, some of the predictions of property prices dropping 30%, has sold a place for 95 million in Sydney. He had, he also broke the auction record in Australia. He had a house at Vaucluse uh, predicted to go for 14 million was the reserve. Uh, and that sold for 24.6 million, only 10.6 million above reserve. So here, ridiculous records set during the pandemic. So you got this dichotomy. I'm not to say that people aren't suffering and struggling, yet there's an incredible amount of confidence. And those people that have a job, a secure job, um, there are some people in business here, uh, and those, um, you know, car dealers and what have you, having record numbers. Uh, one of the solicitors we deal with, his brother's a plastic surgeon. He said he's never been busier. People have got all this cash. They've taken it out of super. They've been on Zoom. They don't look like how they look on Zoom. So they've gotten some plastic surgery done. So we've got... You know, you, you, in previous recessions and, 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 you know, crises, you generally have a, a, a far greater downward shift. You don't start hitting record numbers. And we're seeing, even in our own business, record inquiries, this, this, this webinar, record interest. So a lot of revisions have been done even by the major banks and what have you. A lot of them are seeing that the, the, the drop in interest rates are actually inflationary. And we're seeing people who are, you know, 
you know, they basically had a cut in their home loan by 30%. Uh, we've, we've seen, again, record numbers in lending, the highest lending on record last month uh, of loans in Australia. Um, the highest amount of first home buyers, just the generational sh opportunity where the governments uh, at state and federal level are gifting $50,000 of equity to get into the market. So you don't usually see those results if we've got massive oversupply and hemorrhaging in the market. And this is, it could have been really bad, but what we've had is government that stepped in, great stimulus, great initiatives, banking systems robust, you know, and that's even changing again where there's a shift away from the regulation under the Hain Royal Commission to more stimulation. And so all of this is, is there to, to give people confidence that property is still a trusted asset class. And let me just narrow that down a little bit to even down to residential property, you know, supermarkets or, or shopping centers and I should say, and um, office buildings aren't as essential as homes. And so there's been a tectonic shift there. Not only that, now we look at some of the areas that we've been uh, targeting, which again, a, a land based um, and, and there we haven't seen a price decrease. We're actually seeing a price increase. And so that's really important what type of product you have. Look, and we're going to discuss that a little bit further, but I just wanted to give everyone a, a little bit of a, a barometer on where the market's at, the sentiment. And I would say that if, if you can keep your resolve, there's always going to be a lot of bad news, but the amount of good news uh, and positive news is out there. So you should have a resolve to take an opportunity now. And as even, um, you know, uh, David mentioned that Rob started his business at the GFC. During the last crisis that we had in GFC, we tripled our business. It grew dramatically. And a lot of the clients who bought during that, that peak of paranoia and concern, and one of the biggest things people used to tell me at that time why they didn't want to invest, they were concerned about Greece at the time and concerned about Italy and them not paying their debt. I told them, don't worry, it's not going to affect you. You need to take advantage of you know, the, the market at this time. And, and people made significant sums of money and growth because they looked at some fundamentals and made decisions. The other great tectonic shift that's happening is that people are, uh, are focusing on lifestyle and not accessibility, where the most important thing used to be for a lot of people, I need to be by a property near the city because it was about accessibility. What's really important now, particularly because of the technological revolution and people being able to work from home, and we've actually made that shift in our own business, that it, it's you know work from home forever, uh, in the sense that we don't mind, we do want people to come to the office, you know, a day or two a week from a cultural point of view, but we're even looking at interviewing and hiring more people um, nationally and, and getting the best talent, not, not, not as a business being limited geographically, but so are people thinking about living. And that's why we're seeing some, uh, some other areas are having massive uplifts because people need to only go in one, two or no days a week to the office and those markets are doing well. So, uh, and again, uh, we manage a number of properties uh, over uh, 700 and there's a zero vacancy in them. So, Whereas some areas are seeing some significant vacancy. But anyway, let's, let's move on from there. But I just thought I'd give everyone a bit of a, a, um, a, a pulse of where we're at. So SMSF they're, 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 you know, is a popular vehicle, as David mentioned, and we're seeing growth. And a lot of Australians are taking control of uh, their own superannuation by setting up a self-managed super fund. Uh, it represents 1.1 million Australians. And, and I mean, Rob could even attest to this probably the average amount in all of these funds are people that have significant sums because they do get savings and economies of scale and not paying high amounts to fund managers generally. And they, they can have fixed fees in just the audit and the accounting of the fund. And there's some you know, real reasons why a lot of people consider it and why wealthy people do that. So there's a lot of investors also considering grow, uh, sorry, choosing property as an asset class within that fund. And you can see that the, the comparison there between shares and property over the last four years, been only a slight increase in share investment, where a lot of people have, have you know, decided to add property or direct property as an asset class. Now, if we can shift again. So <clears throat> now th there may be a couple of questions here that A, you may be considering, first of all, an SMSF, even before you even think about a property in SMSF. You know, and that's probably one of the questions that you might wanting to work out because you might be trying to think, you know, is it worth doing self-managed super? That, that sounds like there's a bit of work here. I'm, I'm quite busy. I've got a lot on. Is this complex? So, you know, I'm going to throw that to Rob in a second to answer. And then should you have property in a super fund is the second question. So maybe Rob at this time, I'd, I'd probably ask you, you know, before we jump into some of the detail, yeah. the, the, the term self-managed super fund, you know, is, is it, is it, a, 
can be daunting to some people. And I've had a lot of people as I, you know, I've maybe uh, ex introduced the term to them. They've sort of thought, oh, there's no way I could manage a self managed super fund. It could be overwhelming. I don't have the skill. I'm not an accountant and that. How would you answer that so people don't feel intimidated by it? Thanks, Sam. It's, it's probably one of the, the most leading questions that we do get asked from, uh, from a lot of people who are considering it. And there's a lot of misconception around that in that, you know, as the title suggests, it is a self-managed super fund, but the management of it is not necessarily, like I have a number of clients who have self-managed super funds. None of them manage it themselves in terms of the day-to-day -day running of it. It's more a matter of self-managed in terms of you directing your investment decisions, whether you know you want to buy a specific property or a or a specific type of share or a collectible within super. So the DIY facet relates more about the investments as opposed to the day-to-day -day running. As as David sort of alluded to in his opening comments, it's it's important to have the right team around you in order to make it a feasible and sustainable solution for you from an ongoing basis. And that involves, uh, you know, whether it's a financial advisor, a mortgage broker, and an accountant who's going to do your, the, the returns and audit on, a, on an annual basis for you. So self-managed in terms of investment, as opposed to the, the mechanics of it running it day to day. It's, uh, if you think that you know, you're the one that's going to be running it day to day, you need to have expertise. You need to have accreditation in order to do the accounting and the returns and the audit, mm. which uh, you know your, your traditional people don't have. That's why yeah. you outsource those solutions. That's great. Thanks, Robin. Uh, I think that's the truth. I've got a self-managed super fund, and I don't do the management of it, apart from maybe handling some accounts. Uh, I think it's you've answered that really clearly. That it's more about choice and choosing different assets that you might not be able to do in a particular fund, whereas the actual management and the accounting and all that you hand over to people who are qualified for that, and that. That removes a lot of the concern and the fear and what have you in, in having to worry about the details. So maybe the term is actually a little bit misleading. How about we go to the next uh, page, David? And so here are some of the questions that, that, that are generally asked. And again, look, this is a general um, uh, presentation. So some people may be at, at different levels and understand these, so bear with us. But for those who may not know us, so one of the biggest things, if you want to invest, um, or you, you know, what would be the right amount of money before you even consider having a super fund? Uh, so again, it's one of these leading questions that you do get asked. And it's look, generally, I say 200 would be your starting point. Again, it, when you speak to any financial professional, they're going to caveat every comment by saying it depends on everyone's individual circumstance. But mm. if we can use a rule of thumb, we look at a fund balance of 200,000. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean each single individual has to have a balance of 200,000. A self-managed super fund is a type of superannuation vehicle structure that allows up to four people to pull their money together in order to purchase an asset. So when we look at the fund in total, you may have up to four members who have you know, potentially 200,000 plus, but there's a lot of other circumstances that you need to consider. If, if properties you know, your, your chosen investment vehicle, we need to give rise and thought to, well, you know, 200,000, you know, what's the value of the property that we are looking at? Hence why it's so important to have these questions answered and to engage the, the appropriate financial professionals very early on in the piece in terms of an advisor to give you that advice, in terms of a, a broker to determine the borrowing capacity of the self-managed fund, which Mark will speak about a bit later on, and also an accountant to engage the accountant to determine, well, if I'm going to set this thing up, you know, what are my ongoing costs going to be? So you want to lay all your, your cards out on the table to determine whether it's going to be a financially viable solution for you. But I mean, to sum up, I would say, you know, you, you would want at least a minimum of 200,000. Good, Rob. And, and before we jump out about it, you know, the pro can an SMSF borrow to purchase property? Who can set up the structure? Can that someone do it themselves or are they best to engage someone to do that for them? Well, there's nothing stopping people from, from doing it themselves. I mean, I, I, I've had the, the displeasure of trying to unwind certain structures when people try and set up their own super funds because there's, <clears throat> there's different methods in terms of how you can set it up and the, the trustee structures. And it's, it's extremely important 
And the most cost effective solution is to engage someone to ensure your structure is, is correct. When mm. a super fund is actually borrowing, the complexity grows somewhat in terms of different purchasing entities and vehicles and, and companies need to be established in order to ensure the most seamless tax efficient solution is provided for, for, for the member of the fund and the trustee. That's true. And I, I've, I've seen and experienced that with some people who have unfortunately got a cheap fund set up that the deed's incorrect and there are consequences on capital gains tax. And the few hundred dollars they may have saved have had uh, untold costs uh, that, that uh, have been exaggerated purely because incorrect structure set up. So I, I could encourage anyone, if you're going to set up, particularly if you're going to borrow or, or do uh, a more complex um, uh, lending or things in your, in your super fund, make sure it's the deed is correct and they're the things that can become a uh, complication both with lenders and the tax office in the future. So can any SMSF borrow to purchase property, Rob? Oh, so it's an interesting one as well. So, you know, we'll probably break this up into two parts. So the first part is for, uh, for the folks who have a, a self-managed super fund, uh, they would already have a trust deed. So it's important that the provisions of the trust deed allow for borrowing. Now, borrowing hasn't been in place for an overly long time. It was introduced by former governments back in 2007. So generally speaking, if your fund's been set up after that date, provisions have automatically been included or should be included. Uh, but it's worthwhile having a look through the deed, have a lawyer, accountant, financial advisor, have a look through it to ensure that the provisions are made for that. Because if they're not, then you know, we're, we're sort of behind the eight ball from the start and we're chasing our tail. We're forever going to chase our tail. And it's uh, like Sam, what you said, it's going to be a, a, a very expensive exercise after the fact. So in terms of that, prevention is, is better than cure. Um, in terms of people and the folk who poll that they don't have a self-managed super fund, again, it's important. And as part of the whole advice and accounting process is we determine what the goal and objective of the members are of the super fund. And if it is to borrow, to purchase property, then we ensure that from the outset that when the deeds and all the structures are set up, there's caveats put into that deed that will allow essentially the fund to borrow and to meet the superannuation borrowing rules. So Rob, let's assume that you've got a SMSF, the deed is all great and that. What type of properties can an SMSF purchase? So again, this all sort of broken down. So if you're looking at like, nothing in, in the superannuation space or in the advice space is, is overly simple. Everything's complicated. Um, hence why I've got no hair, but uh, in terms of it's it, the one the one factor we need to consider is you know is your self managed super fund going to borrow or not? Borrowing adds another layer of complexity, and the complexity is in the type of asset that you can purchase. So, looking at it from a, a, a logistical and a legislative point of view, when your fund is borrowing to purchase a property, then that asset needs to be what they call a single acquirable asset, which means it needs to be a single contract. So that doesn't mean an off the plan purchase is ruled off the market, but your traditional off the plan purchases are basically a purchase of land and then a separate contract for the build. If a super fund is borrowing to purchase a property with a dual contract, then it's, it's not permitted to do that. Um, in, in terms of off the plan, if a builder has a single contract, and it's just a matter of asking and saying, is this self-managed super fund compliant? Again, when you have the right team, be it you know, a, a solicitor, an accountant, an advisor, we'd be able to direct you a, a accordingly with that. If you're purchasing an existing property, one that's already up and running, then generally they're all under a, a single contract. So that's, mm. uh, that's basically the types of uh, properties that an SMSF can purchase. There's also the, dis the connect between you know, a, a, a residential property and also a commercial property. So there's nothing stopping a, a super fund from purchasing commercially or in, in terms of the, the residential space. It depends on what, what the motivators are for the members of the fund. Mm. So Rob, yeah, like, I mean, 
what you've said there essentially that uh, for a super fund to purchase, and particularly if it's borrowing, it needs a single contract. And that can be either an existing dwelling or a, let's say, an off-the-plan apartment or townhouse or what have you. As long as it's a single contract uh, where a deposit is paid, but the, the, the balance is always paid on completion and it's not exposed to a construction component. Correct. I guess the only thing, yeah. And, and then otherwise, if there's no borrowing, the SMSF would, would buy... And if it had cash, it would just buy the property in its own name. But understanding with borrowing, there is a little nuance there that technically the fund itself is not doing the borrowing. There is a uh, another entity it put in place, either called a bear trust or a custodian trust. So maybe you could just briefly. That, that's right. So yeah, if if the super fund isn't borrowing, then it's it's free to purchase an off the plan property with you know purchasing land and then you know a build contract. When you've got a, a borrowing arrangement in place under a single contract, we, the establishment of the super fund also involves the setting up of a, a second company called a bear trust company. And as the name sort of suggests, the bear trust is essentially there to serve a purpose of being the name on the contract for sale. So it gets quite complicated. Um, hence why we always encourage individuals to, to seek the advice because you know, I've had the displeasure again of, of trying to unwind situations where, uh, you know, other professionals or, or individuals um, are told that, yes, I want to purchase through my super fund. And if you're borrowing, it's actually potentially not the name of the super fund that goes on the contract of sale. It's, it's the separate trustee company. But again, there's caveats around where you're purchasing that property in terms of a state, because there's different contractual rules. So there are different types of structures that we run through with individuals. So they've got a really robust understanding of exactly what is involved and what company serves what purpose in the whole transaction of, of purchasing a property. Thanks, Robin. And look, one of the panelists have asked a question of here about what about house and land um, packages? And again, this is what we're trying to address here is that if the super fund has cash, it can buy out those houses, the take out a two contract process. However, it can't borrow using this um, bare trust structure or custodian stru trust structure for a house and land package because there's two contracts. However, there is another layer of, uh, of, of uh, strategy that can uh, be applied here where you could set up another vehicle called a, uh, or a unit trust and the super fund can invest in that unit trust along with the uh, investor doing a joint venture. And we've done these before, Rob which can allow these particular properties to be done. But, you know, that may be a little bit more advanced for the discussion today, but there are opportunities where we can address that, but it requires people to have the other property or equity that they can inject uh, in that joint venture structure. Is that right, Rob? Correct, yeah. So that that, yeah. that adds uh, an additional layer of complexity to it all. And and again, it's it, it really does depend on the individual circumstance. So we look at what the options are, um, in terms of establishing the, the super fund, whether it's appropriate, you know, what, what sort of borrowing capacity they may have when we engage, uh, you know, the broking team uh, and then work together as to determining what solutions are available to them. So there is a, there is a, there's a workaround on that, um, uh, but it does require you to have additional property or security or resource. Uh, and it's probably for some people who, who are more established in their portfolio to be able to do that. But let's move on to the next slide, David. Um, yeah, here, here are some, some really good ones. Uh, can I buy the property with an SMSF and live in it? Uh, I only had this happen last week. So someone was thought they could do so. So Rob, can you address that uh, this very is, quickly? This is a very simple one. You're not going to get it. You're, you're not always going to get a simple answer from me, but the short answer is no, you can't. <laughs> Um, so what we're, we're talking about there is more residential. And, and, and if you try to, what happens, Rob? <laughs> oh, mate, you don't want to know. You, okay. you don't want to know. So look, the, the, the short answer there is no, you People can't. People do want to know, Rob. Tell them. <laughs> oh, yeah, they probably do, mate. Oh, yeah. I, I haven't had any of mine because this is explained um, very early on in the piece. But, it, but, but funnily enough, that's from a residential perspective. So um, although... You know, the, the law is very tight in relation to individuals gaining a benefit from SMSF residential property. So from a, from a residential perspective, no, you can't purchase the property and live in it. You also can't tenant it to a, a relative or a related party or a business associate of yours as well. The law doesn't allow you to do that. However, there is a carve out 
to allow, you know, particularly professionals, um, tradespeople who purchase commercial property. When you purchase commercial property, you can lease it back to yourself. And you know, we have a number of uh, doctors and people who run their own businesses who purchase their own factory and then lease it back to themselves. So the, the rules and regulations are very specific about residential property, um, but not commercial. So from a residential perspective, no, you can't buy and live in it, um, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, but you also can't tenant it to what they call a related party as well. So, you know, a, a mum and dad can't buy it and have, you know, their, their kids or someone in their family members uh, live in it. And even if it's paid at market rates, it's just not allowed. Okay, great. What are some tax benefits? You know, why would so, someone look at buying a property in super? Uh, just like they would, you know, superannuation in itself is a, a very tax effective um, retirement vehicle. And the government does it obviously to dangle a carrot to encourage you to save for your own uh, life after you cease working superannuation tax is levied at a maximum of 15%. If you're, if you're earning, uh, you know, the top marginal tax rate at the moment, every dollar you earn is taxed at, you know, circa 45 cents in the dollar. In, in the superannuation world, you know, that dollar stretches a lot further in terms of, you know, the government's only going to dip in and take 15% of that. The, the big benefits, however, so from a property perspective, you know, every single dollar of rent that you earn you know, in your individual name, that may be taxed at the highest marginal tax rate. In the superannuation system, it's only going to be taxed at a maximum of, of 15 cents in the dollar. However, the biggest benefit you get is, you know, later on in life when your super fund enters what they call the retirement or the pension phase and you've reached a certain age, then you cease work, you, you, we flick the switch and turn your superannuation fund into a pension vehicle Pension pensions at the moment render zero tax. So that's zero tax in terms of the income generated, but it's also relating to zero tax in terms of a capital gains tax event as well. So if you do purchase a property whilst you're working and you sell it years down the track, um, once you're retired and over a certain age and you're in the pension environment, with the way the current law stands, there's potentially no capital gains tax payable on that on the sale of that dwelling. That's good, Rob. So in summary, during the superannuation phase, maximum tax is 15%. So, uh, you know, the lowest tax rate you probably know out there. And then in the pension phase, the income stream up to certain thresholds is tax-free. And the, um, the, the, if you do sell or dispose the, that property in the fund, it's capital gains tax-free. So there is uh, certainly a lot of incentive to consider having pro property within super. Correct. There's Sam, just, uh, just in addition to that, if you do sell whilst you are still working and what you're, you're mm. in what they call the accumulation phase, then the, the tax is levied at a maximum of 15% as well. If you've held the asset for, for greater than 12 months, they discount that capital gain by a third. So essentially it reduces the capital gain to 10%. Still very, gr very good. Very so if you did have to sell a property within super, you've had a significant gain your CGT is capped at 10% after holding it for 12 months. So what are some other things you might need to consider, you know, or exit strategy uh, for an uh, SMSF? Yeah, and this is something that a lot of people don't consider, and this is something that we make them very well aware of in terms of uh, not only per, uh, establishing a self-managed fund and, and purchasing a property is, you know, what happens later on in life? You know, what happens if uh, there, there's a death or a disability of a certain member and when you're borrowing in a super fund, remember the, the borrowing is determined upon, it's a function of the level of income you earn because you're going to get your super contributions, which are essentially paid into the fund. It then, it then gives rise to, well, what happens if one of those sources of income or one of the members um, is no longer around or is no longer able to generate a level of income to sustain the borrowing? It, it makes it ineffective you know, we want to make this strategy effective over the long term. And that's, that's where you reap the most benefits. So it's important that we lay out a plan for, you know, some bumps that may occur along the way. And, you know, whether that's looking at, um, you know, do we sell the property if something happens? You know, do we engage personal insurance cover to cover you for it? 
there's a whole range of, there's a whole gamut of factors that we do need to consider. And that's something that, you know, we tell individuals up front to consider things for a rainy day, to make sure this is sustainable over a long period of time. We don't want any nasty surprises. We hope that that doesn't happen, but if and when it does, you want to have an appropriate strategy in place to, to enact. Thanks, Rob. Uh, David, if we could flick a slide again. All right, uh, we'll, we'll now, actually, just before we go on, the, there was a question there um, uh, that Sam has asked. Uh, can you purchase an office uh, for my business uh, in my company and after a couple of years establish an SMSF and then transfer the office to the SMSF and lease it back to my business? Uh, yes, you can. There's, there's potential capital gains tax and stamp duty implications uh, involved um, with that. So anytime a, a asset transfers ownership, there's, there's potential capital gain, but there's also potential stamp duty implications as well. So it needs to be very well thought out um, in order to determine the most cost effective solution for you. Great. And um, well, Bowman's asked the question, you know, is, it, is there a benefit of purchasing commercial property with a loan rather than buying it outright in the SNSF? I'll probably address that. The, uh, the consideration that you'd have there, Bronwyn, is that just like outside of super, if you're investing, there's the value of leveraging where you're using someone else's money. The advantage that you might have in a super fund is that you might want to leave some of your money to invest in other asset classes. We work with a financial planner like Rob, who might say, you know, instead of just buying it in cash, you might want a level of diversification. So that's some of the advantage that you would have in being able to have exposure to more assets. And when you're leveraging, if you're getting a better return on that commercial property than the cost of funds, so let's say your interest rate is 4%, but the commercial property is generating 6%, it just allows you to deploy some more of your capital to invest. Uh, you'd agree with that, Rob? Correct, yeah. Um, Rob, just, just on that, buying inside of SMSF, it's a good protection for assets as well as uh, for business owners, is that correct? Uh, yeah, potentially. It just depends on the individual circumstance, but there's... There's a potential layer of asset protection. It gets a little bit complicated, um, but yeah, it can potentially be a, an asset protection vehicle as well. And just one final question here. Uh, Naveed has asked, do you need your partner's approval to invest in an SMSF? Uh, not a silly question. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, again, Rob can add to this, but it depends if your partner is part of the SMSF. You can set up your own self-managed super fund and roll over your money that you, that you own and you don't need anyone's approval. It can be a, a single person fund. Um, but if your partner is in the SMSF to invest, um, Rob, you can answer that one. Well, there's no hard and fast rule, Sam. So, um, you know, I've, I always say the thought of setting up an SMSF takes a, a significant amount of time longer than actually getting it set up itself. So, you know, the magic happens in all the planning. So, you know, whether you want your partner included, remember, you can have up to four members. I've, I've, got, I've got super funds that have been set up with, uh, you know, a mum and dad, and then kids get to an age where, uh, you know, they, they can have their own superannuation, become members and directors, uh, and then they join later on. So remembering, mm. you know, the, the more assets you can pull together, the, mm. the greater your capacity is to borrow. So there's no yeah. real uh, yes or no needing approval. Yeah. Uh, it's a matter of whether you've got the capacity and the nows to try and do it on your own and whether your partner wants to be involved. I, I, I do also have some other clients where only one member of the couple wants to be involved. The other one doesn't want to be a party to it for, for one reason or another, whether they've got a, a defined benefit superannuation scheme or whatever it may be, personal preference. There's, there's no right or wrong. These things are pretty flexible, but we need to consider all options before you, you hit the go button on, on one particular type of strategy over another. Great. Thanks, Rob. And again, you know, adding a lot of depth there, Naveen, I hope we've answered your question. Now we're going to switch to Mark, who can help us now with, you know, if we've made that decision, gotten the advice, the structure's right, had a, you know, a financial plan like Rob. And oh, look, I just want to commend Rob. He's excellent. I've used him myself. He set up my fund, bought property in the fund, and um, he's just been brilliant. Um, for funding, if you come now and you want to borrow, Mark, what do we need to look at as a deposit? What's the regime look like in, in super? Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, as uh, Rob and Sam have alluded to, the it's very key that you have the right advice before you go into your lending. And 
each needs are different as described, but from a lender's point of view in general terms that they're looking between 150 and 200,000 within the trust. Um, that can vary depending on the statement of advice they receive, but lenders do look at different levels, but that 150 to 200 seems the normal, because if you're buying a certain asset property, um, it's just a rule of thumb that you probably need that to, to buy a good, a good property to fit inside your, um, in your trust. And how much is that as a percentage mark? Like generally, you know, what um, should you look like? You can, you can borrow between a 65 and 80%. Um, so depending on the level of risk and again, the statement of advice for the, the client with the planner is that some people are, you know, they'll leverage up higher, some people leverage lower. So depending how much cash they want to use. So yeah, you can borrow up to 80% within your fund. Um, but then on average, based on um, experiences, people are comfortable around the 70% mark. So generally you need about a 30% deposit. Yep. So when you look at your property, um, the lending isn't as much as you might do outside of super. So you need to be aware that you need a substantial deposit. Correct. So can you borrow in your own name or who's ultimately liable for the loan? Well, the, when you borrow within a, a SMSF, it's a, a, what they call a, a limited recourse borrowing agreement. So it's done by the um, SMSF trustee and, and the property is owned by the Bear Trust. So borrowing your own name, is, it's, it's done through the trust. So the, when you do get the advice, the trust is owning the asset, the Bear Trust is owning the property, and the loan is geared to that one security. It's, um, it's a, that loan is tied to it. There's no, you can't include that in any other. Um, okay, so you can't, you're not technically ever borrowing your own name. No. Uh, th there's a different entity that you may control, but not you. But are you liable for the loan yourself? Um, you're limited, again, to the recourse. The, so a lot of people think that it's their loan, but it's actually SMSF's loan, which you are a beneficiary. So the, the, the loan is limited to, to that um, property. If that property was sold and that loan was extinguished with inside the trust. All right. So if there was a, a shortfall on that, are you personally liable? Uh, depending, if they, uh, I believe Rob um, asking you, but uh, from a cash point of view, um, the lenders do what's called a liquidity test. So they like the, fa the fact that the, the um, SMSF has cash available um, to make sure that they can service a shortfall, but that's not the goal. But if there was a shortfall, that the, the, the contributions of the trust, I'm sure would absorb a loss in general terms. But again, Rob might um, have a bit more uh, Sorry, that was a real technical question. I, I thought yeah. I'd throw it at you there, Mark. So, Rob? No, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, so the, the government um, a while ago introduced liquidity tests in terms of self-managed super funds meeting in you know, ongoing borrowing capacity. And when, when we do our calculations, we calculate liquidity requirements. We also stress test the whole situation as well. So we'll look at what the prevailing interest rates are for self-managed super fund loans and we'll project them at an additional 2% to ensure that if you know rates do go higher or if people lose their jobs or have a reduction in income, that it's a sustainable strategy. The, the liquidity requirement is, is designed from a, a diversification point of view. Back in the early day when these were introduced, individuals were buying uh, property with borrowed money with pretty much every single dollar they had in super um, and then had nothing left for a rainy day. So, it made it it created a lot of stress and angst. So, you know, APRA, the regulators, have come out and said, "Well, you know, we want to make sure that we can see some available money." And every, I'm pretty sure, Mark, from a lender's perspective, every lender has a different liquidity requirement. But I think pretty much all of them have yeah. some sort of requirement where, you know, the individuals in the fund need to ensure that they've got ready access to money in case, you know, they purchase a property, it settles and you know, they can't find a tenant or, or something of that nature or some unforeseen cost um, is born upon them if they buy an existing property and they have to do a, um, a repair or something of that nature. It's important that they've, they've got some. We, we address all that um, and we factor all that into calculations. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Well, I, I guess we're going to keep moving a little bit quicker because uh, we've got a few things to get through. But what uh, there's a couple of questions I'll quickly answer. Um, can you, can you use equity in one SMSF or one property, really, uh, as security for another one? The simple answer to that is no. Yeah. And uh, Peter, you've asked the question here, am I the director of the Bear Trust? Well, the Bear Trust is a trust. There's, they'd be, have a corporate trustee and you would be a director of that corporate trustee. So 
Um, who would help with setting, uh, setting up an SMSF loan, Mark? Well, the best thing is that you, you seek a advice of a broker. Um, and I can only uh, say to you that you must go with somebody that actually understands it. And as Rob's alluded to, that it's a, it's a village of support to have that experts around you with a, a good financial planner, a good statement of advice, your accountant, and having a brokering um, uh, business like ourselves who specialise this and uh, offer, offer a, a loan strategy report to, to uh, focus on that. And uh, Rukmini has asked, Mark, why there's so, so few lenders for SMSF loans and why is interest rates so high for SMSF loans? Um, again, I think during the, the recent changes with the Royal Commission, the banks decided there was a conflict with their internal financial planning arms and funding the loan. Um, so, for example, the Westpac Group was a major funder of self-managed super funds that had internal financial planning and now they've divested of the financial planning um, arms of their business and therefore they've um, let go of the SMSF funding as a choice of direction of risk. So there's limited funders out there. It's not, it's not like um, everyone's exited the market. It's just a, a few choice major banks. But the beauty is that the, it's still a very robust um, uh, modelling and the lenders are out there and you, that's why... But you why are the rates are high too, Mark? Like and the rates are high um, because the, I think the limited um, amount of the business and there is a risk associated with it. So it's a, it's a, ro a price for risk um, yeah. from a lender's point of view. And particularly that, around that limited recourse. The so limited recourse probably, restricts yeah. them. So they feel yeah. that with their, when you hear limited and banking, it costs you more money. Um, yep. So I believe that in, in general terms, yeah. that um, it is a limited recourse lending. So it's a, a limited risk yeah. for the bank. So therefore they price accordingly compared to standard. <laughs> And will the, will the interest rates come down in time? I'll probably say, answer that one with many, and that is eventually uh, with some competition and some opportunity and, and you know, things change in marketplaces, there generally is. Someone will say, there's an opportunity here and we'll go for that. So David, maybe just if we go to the next slide. So look, creating a portfolio, you need a team. And I would say like in anything, I would suggest that, you know, there, there are a few people here to help you and that'd be definitely a financial planner. Uh, to, to an establishment of the fund and the statement of advice that you need, an accountant that would do the ongoing accounting of the fund, unless you're an accountant yourself, or you want to do that and you find that terribly exciting. Um, the mortgage broker, again, and not just any mortgage broker, you need people who are intimately aware of the um, nuances of, you know, the properties, the, 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 the bear trust, the custodian trust and the states. There's, there's so many things you need to be aware of and, expertise there is really important or it can become very messy very quickly and again if you want property uh, someone a property strategy who can help you source the right product and doing annual review probably the only last person that we actually don't have on here and this is something the financial planner could work with and would provide as an estate planner because understanding how you work out your will and your estate and how your super fund is treated is really important because uh, it's the transfer of those assets on your passing are critical and there might be some uh things that need to be done in your deed and your estate to make sure that is managed really well. Uh, let me just click one more slide, David. So <clears throat> coming down here now to, you know, one, once you've sort of gotten your team together, your fund set up, the deeds checked out, your, your interest in lending, you've checked that out, you know, research is going to be critical in actually choosing the particular property. It's not a magical box, the, the SMSF. You still need to do the homework and be just as rigorous if you're going to buy investment property. The things that you're going to need is, um, you know, a 30% deposit that we've talked about. Um, but when you're looking for property, the fundamentals remain. And that is just because, you know, you've, you've got cash flow coming in generally from your employer, putting money into superannuation, you've got a large deposit, doesn't mean you should be uh, negligent or sloppy and just think I can absorb that. I would be always looking to get the maximum growth and the maximum yield. You know, there, there are three things that I always like to tick when I'm looking for property. And that is number one, uh, am I getting a high rental yield? Because cash flow now is really important. You know, Warren Buffett says you never go out of business making a profit. You, you know, capital growth is potential, whereas the yield that you're getting uh, can make a real difference today. It can actually become comp, uh, capital growth because you actually can be paying down debt, and that becomes capital um, increase 
uh, in your favor while you're paying down that loan. So you wanna look at areas where there's population growth and employment growth uh, and infrastructure that does that. You know, that's really the first law of economics is supply and demand. And um, you know, what I would always be looking at is not uh, super regional areas. I'd be looking at areas where there's consistent population growth and employment growth. And that's where the demand occurs and that will push up prices. Um, I'd also, you know, some of the considerations, uh, uh, you know, potentially new properties where there's depreciation for the fund, there's tax benefits there, particularly people on higher incomes, uh, even some people over a quarter of a million dollars a year that might be hitting with superannuation surcharges. There are some benefits there. And positive income and capital growth, so they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, particularly if, you know, the, one of the main reasons you, you're looking at using superannuation and super as a vehicle for invest, investing into property, it's there to fund the lifestyle at some point. And, you know, no one complains they're making too much money out of their property. They always complain if their property is costing them a lot of money and it's not making enough. So if you do consider having a, a strong positive income, particularly in the fund, that helps the fund itself not only carry the cost of the property, but pay down that property and have it, as, as, as Rob said at the end, as an exit, it's, it's, you, it's owned and you've got an income stream versus what happens if, you know, I've stopped working and there's no more income coming in, how do I pay for this property? So that, that becomes really critical. Uh, next slide, please, Deb. So let's see, here's a case study. This is for a particular client. And this shows you some of the properties that, that we like to consider. And this was a single um, contract property. They are rare. Uh, it's hard to get these uh, particular properties at times, particularly house and land, but there are some developers or builders where you can source them. Um, this property was, uh, uh, it was a three bedroom and two bedroom dual income property. The client had $412,381. That's very precise within super. The property price was 547,000. This is in Brisbane. They needed a deposit of 191,900. That's what they put to it. The loan was 65%. So this was a 35% deposit. It just allowed them to get a cheaper rate. Uh, there was some other costs in setting up the fund. And the, the, the rest of the, so they used, you know, close to 200,000 of their money uh, as opposed to, to towards the deposit. But the rest of the cash in this particular loan and working with our finance team were able to set up an offset account. So they could then put the balance of that superannuation money against that loan. So effectively, their, their loan balance is only, uh, as you can see there, uh, it, was, it was about, I think about 150, 160 or so in the end. Um, the, the net amount, well, well, yeah, 150, 140. So the interest payment per annum is about $20,000 a year. The yield was quite high at 5.9%. So they were generating about $32,000 a year in rent. Their employer was also putting in about 13,000 a year. So they were generating $46,000 worth of cash flow. That's 32,000 rent, 13,000 roughly in, in, in employer contributions. So there's a surplus of $25,000, $26,000. So when you think this loan here is sitting about 140, the net debt, $26,000 a year in surplus, um, it's only about six years that this client can actually have that amount in the offset account to basically zero out the actual interest on the loan which is quite fantastic. Uh, and what this client would then consider is to actually build up that surplus to again, over, well, maybe 250, 300,000, let's say in a couple of years time, they could then potentially their fund because they've got a few years uh, continue uh, to keep working is look at purchasing another property like this and work towards having that property paid. What they can also do is at some stage in the future, Rob is, you know, where you would probably look at them as if, if a person's particularly got their home uh, paid off or close to paid off and they're, they're on a certain income, maybe you could just tell us very briefly what salary sacrificing and why they might consider salary sacrificing up to the maximum deductible amount into super. Why would someone consider that? Rob? Yeah, so we, we look at an individual circumstance and look at whether salary sacrificing is a viable strategy. And as the name suggests, salary sacrificing involves you sacrificing some of your salary and that being deposited straight into your superannuation account. And the, the reason why you would do that is because it's a, a tax effective incentive that government gives you. So for essentially for every dollar that you would have earned in employment income gets directed straight into the super system. So instead of you earning a dollar and being taxed at you know, 40, 45 cents and, and then receiving 55 cents in every dollar, that money works a bit harder for you. So that dollar goes into the super system is only taxed at, 
at 15%. So you've got 85% of that money working harder for you. And whether you use that to invest, whether you use it to pay off a loan, um, you know, that's, that's sort of advice that we give you. So salary sacrificing is a, a very tax effective strategy that many people employ. Uh, and you're not restricted in terms of what age, um, potentially. Um, it just depends on your individual circumstance. So we, we, you know, we consider or a financial professional is going to consider every single uh, strategy. So getting this done properly involves quite robust and comprehensive advice. It's not a transactional thing where someone will come in and say, let's set up a super fund and it's set up. But, you know, we get the you know, we get the uh, paint board out and we, we basically start from scratch and look at everything. And a self-managed super fund and the establishment of it to buy a property may only be a, a one piece of the whole jigsaw puzzle. So we'll look at all the other pieces, piece them together to give you an accurate snapshot of, you know, where you want to head and how to get there. Thanks, uh, Rob. And just look, there's a question here from Peter. What's the age is the upper limit to invest in property? Well, there's no uh, age at all to stop you from investing in property. Maybe if the question as I might anticipate it, uh, Peter, is that maybe to use to invest through superannuation property and SMSF, is there an upper age there, Rob? Maybe you could address that. Uh, well, it depends on the, the lending side of things as well. Like obviously, you know, borrowing involves an additional layer of risk, um, you know, and to borrow for someone who's, uh, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna borrow and take out a 30 year loan and, and you're, you know, 60 years of age, and you've got five years left to retirement. Then, you know, you, you need to consider those those factors. So, although there's no upper limit, um, you know, I've had clients who are, you know, very late in their working life who who purchase property outright, and have got the the financial capacity to do that through super. When you're borrowing, then you're at the mercy of the the lenders, um, and that'll determine on whether they've got the appetite to borrow, you know, lending's a lot tighter these days. And uh, you know, Mark can probably attest to that. Um, so there's no technically any upper age limits. Is there a limit on what age you can keep putting money into super though? I guess that would be one age limit to consider. So right? Look, there, there, there is obviously. So it depends on whether you're working or not. So you can contribute these days up to about 67. Um, and once you're over 67, then you've, you've got to meet work tests, et cetera. So this is, you know, more typical a strategy that people employ um, you know, earlier on than you know in their in their sixties. You'd, mm. you'd you'd really consider the whole gamut and have a look at how appropriate it is based on the individual circumstance. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. Look, uh, some questions here. Sorry, guys, we there is a, an oversight here. There, people are asking, uh, what are the costs to make on an ongoing basis of the SMSF and some of the maintenance costs there? So realistically, in this case study here, oversight on our behalf, so apologise, but the, you know, annually there'd be for SMSF, Rob, you know, a, an accounting fee and an audit fee. What does that number look like? Uh, oh, it depends on your accountant. So again, you know, prior but to, roughly, yeah. prior, it uh, could be anywhere from two grand to three, four grand. I'm, I'm not too sure it's, mm -hmm. you know, how long's a piece of string, but these are things that, you know, we'll make individuals aware of, um, and it's a case by case basis. So, you know, we'll, we'll work with their individual accountants um, and have a look at, look, what would be the cost to administer? Depends on how complicated the fund is. So a super fund that, you know, has a property without borrowing is generally a lot more simplistic than one with a limited recourse borrowing arrangement. Hence, an accountant may charge more for that borrowing arrangement. So mm. it's probably really a question for your individual accountant, um, but the costs are, you know, well, let's, say, let's, say, Rob, let's say, let's say, you know, let's choose 3000 a year, just as, as a number. Now, how does that compare then to someone who may have, let's say, you know, let's say you've got this portfolio here, there's a property here worth about 550, they might have 50, you know, uh, some money in cash, maybe some uh, managed funds or shares or so. Let's say it's a $600,000 portfolio. If you had that in a retail fund, what would be your management expense ratio generally? You know, uh, anyway, done for free. depending on depending on the type of fund that you have, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, you're, you're looking at eighty to hundred basis points, so you know, roughly about 0.8 to one percent. Um, so about would five or your... six thousand dollars. So if you compare the cost of a an SMSF, it's three thousand dollars. It can be cheaper, and this is probably why some people over time consider, particularly with large balances, to reduce that eighty point point eight percent or one percent of the fund. Um, it can be quite 
uh, expensive when you have a lot of assets under management. So that's Correct. why people shift to SMSF because it becomes generally a, a static fee versus a percentage fee of the funds under management. So look, again, there are a lot of questions here about the fees. Uh, 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 so number one, you know, are they tax deductible? Yes, they are to the fund. What are all the costs? Look, again, these depend on the complexity in the fund and what you would want to do is know all those costs up front and the financial planner would disclose the setup costs and an expectation of the ongoing costs for working with the accountant. You'd have an idea of that. Um, and then what are the other costs in relation to the property, which again, should be in this uh, case study and those things would include just like your normal thing, like uh, you know, your council rates, your water rates and what have you. So you would have to take them out. So really that surplus would be you know, closer to $18,000 uh, in this scenario here. I would say, but it's still it's a sensible surplus. And to top that surplus up, if you're in a position you could salary sacrifice, you could increase that more and accelerate the payment off that property in the fund. Because as, as Rob said, you can divert some cash that you know you might be paying 40% in uh, uh, outside of super and put it towards the, uh, your investment property, only be paying 15% on that, that amount going into super. So David, we might um, keep going and, and, and I look, really want to thank everyone for a lot of the questions and there are a lot there. And I would, you know, we probably, we're really running at past time. And again, the interest is high and I thank everyone for that. Um, there's, there's, there is a level of complexity and there's a level of detail. And what we'd always want to do is make sure we can answer all of your questions. And I would say that, you know, a one-on-one -on -one with um, Rob or anyone in our team, we'd, we'd happily introduce you. And that is so you can get a little bit more detailed information and more specific information to your circumstance. And that's what's really important about setting up a fund and, and doing that. You need a personal strategy and a personal plan to really take into consideration your situation. And as we've said tonight, this is very much a general information education session to allow you to be uh, cognizant of some of the things you need to be aware of. What's certainly important is that you do need to have a team around you. Uh, you should have a strategy uh, you want to make sure you use research to make all the informed decisions. You want the right finance and the right structures to do that. And a team that can manage it all the way through from finish, uh, from the beginning to the, to the end. And then the ability to keep reviewing your portfolio. Uh, you know, I was talking to a, a potential client today and there's, there's around about 2 million property in, investors out there according to the Australian Taxation Office, maybe just a little bit under that. Of that 2 million, about 1.6 million have one property. Then it drops dramatically to those people who have two and even less for three and four and on and onwards. And, and a lot of that is really based on the fact that people don't have a strategy or plan. A lot of people could have a lot more. They just don't know when to or how to. They think they're set by doing one property, but often you, you need a little bit more to, to become financially independent. A lot of people's expectations for what they from a lifestyle point of view is a lot, a lot greater these days. And the life expectancy is also increased. I believe it's 89 for men and 91 for women. So people want to finish work uh, finish work sooner and they live longer and they've got to fund a few decades worth of living and they want to expect a little bit more from a lifestyle point of view. So all that's all, all to say uh, in saying that is that you really need to have a strategy. You need to have a plan. You need the right people around you. And we would in, we encourage uh, you, if you are interested to look at this, super is just a wonderful vehicle from a tax point of view. It's legislated. You know, uh, you know if you're an employee, money's got to go in there you may want to take an interest in that and really make it work to your advantage. What's roughly the cost, just maybe to finish off this here, of maybe setting up a, a SNSF with a bear trust and a trustee company, Rob? That's certainly a finite one as a set up one. So what, yeah, it's, what a, it's a very to? hard question to answer because it depends on the individual circumstance, what's involved. And, you know, there's, there's thousands of financial advisors out there, you know, and the ones that do it, the, the costs uh, do vary. Um, you're, you're looking at, look at a rough ballpark, you know, we're, we're looking at about 4,000 um, in our firm for, to set up everything to get the advice. Um, yeah. We'll be able to give you a concrete answer once we determine um, your situation, but that's roughly with having everything established, the, the advice, the structures, the, the whole mm. kit. And so for, for a straightforward structure, Rob, 4,000 is what you expect and that met, what that gives you, is a SMSF trust, a bear trust, trustee company, and a statement Everything. of advice. Everything. Yeah, which is pretty good. Like, look, I'm doing this, and I know a lot of people out there, some people that really make a lot of money out of this, and there's people that charge between seven to $15,000 where you don't really need to spend that. You're getting you know, professional experience advice. 
you're not going to get away from it for any, any much less. But the great thing is the fund itself or the money you've got in super as you roll it into the fund can pay for that. It doesn't have to come out of your pocket, does it, Rob? Uh, generally, no, no. You, I mean, you yeah. have the choice, but we yeah. can extract that generally from the, the superannuation balance. Yeah, so it's a one-off setup cost. You've got the structures, the ongoing costs are generally accounting and audit fees, and it comes down to the complexity of, of how many things you've got in your fund and work that has to be done. But that, that generally can range about, you should, I think, most often expect about $2,000 as a base case to probably around about 3000 for most funds. But again, if you've got a lot more in there, a lot more work, you're just going to pay for a little bit more accounting to be done. So I think we're just about to the end there. So again, if you are interested, you want to speak to someone, get some more specific uh, uh, information to your situation. There's no cost in, or obligation at all if you want to talk to someone, have a chat, uh, be introduced to Rob in that. Um, and we would you know, happily help you out there. So you can thank you for attending tonight. Um, oh, look, oh, there's one more question. Bronwyn, you've been really uh, asking a lot of questions. That's great. Can you use surplus super to pay down the principal of a property loan in SNSF? Rob? Oh, you're on mute, Rob. I'm just Sorry, mate. Yeah, I'm just trying to read the question. Can you use surplus super to pay down the principal? Yes, if, it's, if it is in the the superannuation environment so you, you can you can use it to pay down the the debt in terms of making additional repayments and maybe just one more can what's the amount you can inject into super if you want to put a whole stack of cash in there Rob? so it depends on whether you want the uh, to come out of pre-tax dollars or post so yeah, you generally speak yeah so a pre-tax you're looking at up to twenty five thousand a year um, and that includes your employer's nine and a half percent obligation. There's certain circumstances these days where you can exceed that depending upon your super balance and what your contributions have been in previous years. So again, it's relatively complicated from an after tax perspective. So if you've got money in the bank, um, if you're under a certain age, 65, 67, you can contribute up to 300,000 in the one in the in the one lump sum that's per member of the super fund thanks rob so again a complex system hopefully we've, we've given some straight answers and given some information and not confused people uh, and it, it, you know if you have been interested thank you really appreciate it tonight i think we'll wrap that up right now david i'll hand back to you thanks rob thanks mark you're very welcome. Thanks very much, Sam. And again, thank you, Rob. Thank you, um, Mark, for your time tonight. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. I can see that everybody stayed right to the very end of this session. There were a number of questions. Thank you very much. For those of you questions we didn't get to, we'll endeavour to get back to you in the next day or two personally um, and answer those questions. And, and as we said, it's very simple to get in contact with our team. Hello at dpn.com.au. So with that in mind, we'll say thank you again to everybody. Thanks for joining us. And we look forward to talking to you in the future. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.